Bibles there, turn to James chapter 1. We had big plans. We were going to go very fast, and we were going to work our way through James. And now I'm telling you, we're going to be in James for a while. Um, the more I'm digging into it, each verse is becoming almost a sermon by itself. I'm, I've got three verses planned for today, and I'm not sure we'll get through all three. But there's just a lot of really good stuff in there, and I don't want to miss it. Amen? So that's what we're going to do. And if we don't get through those through today, those three verses today, that's okay. We'll come back at it next week unless we are with the Lord. All right? So would you stand with me? James chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. Understand this, my brothers and sisters. You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. There's a sermon right there, amen? amen. Ooh. Human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. So get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word that God has planted in your hearts, for it has the power to save your souls. Let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, these are very challenging words. These are things we need to work on, Lord. These are things that we all can get better at. We thank you for being the kind of God that doesn't just tell us what we want to hear, but you tell us what we need to hear. But today I pray that we would hear it clearly, plainly, honestly, that we'd really listen to what you're telling us. Not sit there and think that these words are for someone else, but apply them to who we are and where we're at. Myself included, Lord, help us all to listen to you speak to us today. What's in your very precious name? All God's people said? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> Just do it. You know, we are a society in many ways that is driven by marketing plans. You know, we're a society that is driven by companies and their slogans. And whoever has the best ad slogan usually ends up selling the most product. Lots of times the products that we buy has nothing to do with the quality of the product. It has to do with how well did they do advertising it. And we buy what we hear. I was thinking about just in my lifetime, you can even tell where you lived, when you lived, how long you've lived, how old you are, by if you know these ad slogans. Just, just tell me if you know these slogans. You ready? Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to say the slogan. You tell me the company. You ready? You're in good hands. Don't leave home. American Express. Right? The quicker picker-upper. Oh, not as many paper towel people. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, have it your way. Yeah, my math teacher used to always say, hey, this ain't Burger King. You don't get it your way. All right. That was, that was my father, too, by the way. Uh, one that you see now. What's in your wallet? Capital one. Thank you. Come on, it's during every basketball game. Don't you people watch basketball? What's wrong with you? Uh, oh, here we go. Same person that just answered this is going to answer this one, I guarantee you. The happiest place on earth. Yes. Very soon it's going to open back up again, right? I don't believe it's the happiest place on earth. But anyways, I'll move on. Um, it keeps going and going and going. Remember the Energizer Bunny? Yeah, you kids, you don't know what we're talking about. Uh, when it absolutely positively has to be there overnight. FedEx, come on, people. Um, <clears throat> they're great. Yes, come on. Yeah, yeah. So easy, even a caveman can do it. Geico, Geico yeah. That was before the uh, little lizard dude, right? Um, I don't know. I remember this one, but I don't know if you'll catch it. Is it in you? Gatorade? Gatorade, yes. Remember Gatorade? Yes. <laughs> One of my favorite, finger licking good. Finger licking good, yeah, KFC. Well, 
those are just some of the others. The top 10. Here's the top 10 of all time. All right? Number 10. Can you hear me now? Verizon. Remember Verizon? Now, that was, um, yeah. You, you, you'll know what era you lived in. These are the top 10 greatest selling, most successful ad campaigns in the history of marketing. Number nine, uh, American runs on Dunkin. Dunkin Donuts. Uh, number eight, the breakfast of champions. Yeah. Number seven, I wouldn't have got this one, but uh, a diamond is forever. I, no, it's De, De Beers? Is that the name of the company? In the, I, don't, I didn't know. I, you know. I don't know. I, my poor wife, I mean, she doesn't get many diamonds. I didn't know anything about that. Um, I know I know this one. Melts in your mouth, not in your hands. Yeah, baby. Uh, because you're worth it. No, L'Oreal. L'Oreal. Yeah. Um, this one, now, this is Coca-Cola, and I thought it was something else. It's op Open Happiness? Yeah, Coca-Cola. I, 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 uh, mm, Okay. Now, number three, where's the beef? Yes. Wendy's, yes. If you were alive in the 80s, you remember where's the beef. Remember the little old lady? Oh, that was awesome. Yeah. Number two, think different. Apple. Apple computers. Apple computers. And then number one is the one that is our title, the most successful ad campaign of all time. Marketing, money, sales, uh, just general kind of like infusion into general society, just do it by Nike, just do it by Nike. And it became kind of like a, um, more than a slogan, it became a fashion statement. People were wearing it. Uh, people were saying that it was now their, their, the way they were going to live their lives. I mean, it became huge. It's still all over everything. Nike still uses it in a lot of ways, not completely, but still uses it in a lot of places. And I think James, in writing this book, would have really liked the Nike ad, just do it. Because there's a lot of Christians that hear what God is saying. They know what God is teaching, but they don't do it. It stops there at the hearing. And in these verses right here, I was going to originally go 19 through 27, verses 19 through 27, and, and, but verses 19 through 21 are going to talk about the hearing of the word, the receiving of the word. And then next week, if we get done with today's, 22 to 27, we'll talk about the doing of the word. Let's just talk about the hearing. It is our responsibility to hear God speak to us and how we hear that. And who are we listening to? You tell your kids all the time that they should be listening to the right people. Amen? They need to pick out the right people to listen to. You can tell when someone's not been listening to the right people. They've been listening to the wrong people. We need to learn how to identify God's voice in our hearts. We need to learn how to block out all of the world's voices. We got voices coming. We hear things. We are bombarded with things. Ad campaigns and internet and television and music and radio and everything else that's coming to us and, and blogs and all this other stuff that's coming to us. And everybody's got to share their opinion. Everybody's got to get on social media. Everybody's got to say what they think about every single thing. Everything that happens in politics, they've got to give their opinion. They've got to watch it and then kind of turn it back to them like they're the, the Walter Cronkite of today. And they're going to give their version of what's happening. Everybody's got to give their opinion. And, and at some point, we need to shut up and listen to God. And so let's just talk about how we hear. Now, verse 19 again. Look at verse 19 again. Understand that when you are hearing this verse, you got to take it in context. Don't ever take something out of the Bible out of context. Number 19, you, you math majors. Verse 19 came after verse. Yes, we got some math majors in the house. Very good. Verse 18 came before. Verse 17, verse 16, that whole chapter. It came on the heels of him talking about his spoken word, his word. You, you and I have God's word. The problem is we're not listening to it. 
you heard it, but you're not listening. Right? You hear what it says. Often, we know exactly what it says. But we're not applying it. So how are we hearing it? Are we really hearing it? Are we really listening? Are we really listening to what he says? So verse 19, when it says, Understand this, my brothers and my sisters. You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. It's talking about, it's in the context of the last verse. We're talking about God's word. He's talking about how you respond to God's word when he speaks to us. You're outlined there. If you want to have a faith in Christ that is growing, and I'm not talking about how some Christians get saved and then they stay on the milk for 20 years. I'm talking about a Christian walk in Christ that grows. And you make mistakes, but you grow. And you get better, and you grow. If you're going to have, that's the correct kind of relationship. You expect that from your children, right? You expect them not to stay on the milk like they were when they were infants. They're going to they're gonna go to those nasty little bottles of baby food. Remember those things? Those things are nasty. And then you're going to go from step one to step two to step three and all that. And then all of a sudden you start slipping them. Of course, us dads, we start slipping food from the the table a little sooner than everyone else, but then you start slipping them food, and then you start kind of gradually putting them on, you know, more solid food, and as they grow, they get into more of the meat. Amen? Christians down here in the milk, there is a problem. And could it be that you're not listening to what God has said? You want to have the correct relationship with God, a growing relationship where you are becoming more and more like Christ all the time, That happens through his word. You cannot be a successful Christian and not dig into his word. If you're trying to cut corners, if you're trying to do it another way, if you're trying to, if you think, well, I go listen to Lincoln preach every week, so that's enough. You're going to starve to death. It's not enough. Okay? Hopefully, I give you a good meal of God's word when you come, but just like when you eat a meal, you're going to get hungry in a few hours after that. You need more and more and more of God's word. You can't, you can't thrive as a Christian without digging into God's word. If you're not reading his book, if you're not reading his words, I don't care what else you're doing, you are starving yourself. You can't have a relationship with Christ without a proper relationship to God's word. You've got to love his word. You've got to, thrive. You've got to want it. You've got to desire it. You've got to, you can't wait to get into it. Your first desire should be, when you have a problem, to dig into God's word to figure out where he's talking to you, what's happening, along with prayer, et cetera, obviously. I'm not saying instead of those things. I'm saying in addition to, including these, these things. But God's word cannot be left out. His word is truth. It's perfect It will never fail you, and you've got to live by and understand and apply his word. Now, you say, when I read verses, I don't understand it. That's like all of us. There's a lot of verses I read when I read them, I don't understand them. I read verses, and I think to myself, I thought I understood what it meant, and then when in this walk of life, this phase of my life, I realize, oh, this means something different for me now. God is constantly showing me things about the same verses I thought I knew. That's how awesome our God is. His word, we've got to take it, we've got to apply it, and it starts by listening, hearing it, listening to what God says. You can't be a Christian, a Christ-like person, without listening to what Christ says to do. And it starts right there in his word. It doesn't start with other good Christian authors. There's a lot of great Christian authors out there. Amen? A lot of great Christian authors. Great ones. Okay? Name off some of my favorite. You can name off some of your favorite. Great Christian authors. Don't you dare read their book and not read God's word. Don't you dare do that. Their book should help you understand what God's word is saying. It should complement it, etc. They're humans. They're going to make mistakes. But you get in there. You dig. You you listen. You learn. But it starts right here. And going to one of them uh, without going to God's word is trying to build your house without a foundation. The first sign of a little tremble in Southern California and the house is coming down. Amen? 
We, we have earthquakes every day. You realize that, right? And we don't even know we're having them. Okay? There's a site you can get on. You can look at the Caltech thing, the, whatever that thing is. And, and you can get on. And it's constantly doing this all the time. You would think, oh, it must be doing this. No, no, it's not. It's doing this. We are constantly moving and shaking. And, and you build your house on uh, something without a foundation, without the right foundation, it is coming down soon. The first sign of any little tremble, you know, weather, shake, whatever. That's how it is. Christian, you base your Christian life on anything but God's word. You are going to fold the first time any issue comes up. And it's Southern California, and we are all sinners, so you're going to have an issue before 1215. Like, you're going to have problems. We're all sinners. I mean, it, it's going to happen. Okay, so this verse then says three things right off the bat. According to God's word. Remember now, all these are referring back to reading his word. Okay? And so it says, be quick to listen. That word is take chos in the Greek. I'm sure I'm saying it wrong. But it means to be ready or to be prompt. You be ready to listen. You be ready to hear God speak. You be expecting God to speak to you. The Holy Spirit's in us. If you have Jesus in your heart, you have the Holy Spirit. So that means he's speaking to you. He's going to be in your heart, speaking to you every moment, every day. Listen. Be ready to hear. Right? Kid comes into class, talking to his friend, earphones in his head. Okay? Earbuds, pods, whatever these things are, sticking out of their ears, these things. Okay? And they come in, and they're talking, and they got, they're looking this way. I'm over here. They're looking this way. They're talking to a friend. They got earphones here. Their phone is going in their ears. They got 18 things going. I'm over here. Uh, hello. <laughs> it's time for class. They're not ready to listen. Christians, we can laugh at them all we want. We do the exact same thing. We're not ready to hear. It's like God has to do like what I do. I have to sometimes walk over and like literally get like within inches of them before I shock them into listening, noticing, oh, hey, pastor's here. What do you know? <laughs> God has to smack us in the head sometimes to get us to listen. And it shouldn't be that hard for our Savior to get our attention. Listen. Be quick to listen. Nothing else should keep you from listening to his word. If you tell me that you don't have time to read God's word, I'm going to say you better change your life fast. Now, number one, that's probably not true. It's probably an exaggeration. You're probably being a little dramatic. Number two is, if that really is true, then you need to make some big changes and fast. If your life is so busy you don't have time to read God's word, your life needs to change right now. Not tomorrow, not next season, now. Okay? There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Number two thing he says, after he says, be quick to listen. Don't let anything else take, it, take, take the place of listening to God. Nothing. Kids, let me hear you. Let me, I want to make sure you hear me say this. Nothing is more important than listening to Jesus talk to you. Listen to him. I know you got parents telling you what to do. You got teachers telling you what to do. You got principals telling you what to do. You got policemen telling you what to do. You got firemen telling you what to do. You got everybody's telling you what to do. In fact, probably your older brother and sister is telling you what to do. Try to learn at, at a young age to listen to God. Pray and listen to God speak to you. If you listen, he will speak. Sometimes we'll say, well, God's just not telling me. He's speaking to you. Now, he may not be answering the question you want answered at that moment. Well, he is answering. He may be just saying, chill and wait, right? He may just be saying, wait. But he is speaking. You will hear him if you just listen. Now, I, I know in my walk, lots of times God is saying, wait. And I think part of that is my own weaknesses, but a part of that is, I think, the lessons he teaches all of us. Just wait. Listen. Now, Number two, he says, now, don't just be quick to listen. He says, be slow to speak. I don't know who told me. I think it was a Sunday school teacher who told me one time, listen, Lincoln, you got two ears, you got one mouth, you should be listening at least twice as much as you talk. <laughs> right? And I like that. That's, that's where we should start. 
right? But slow to speak doesn't mean necessarily, like grandma used to try to teach us, count to 10 before you say anything. Uh, Listen, counting to 10 is not going to help me. I don't know about you. I'm going to have to count a lot higher than 10, right? But, I mean, it's a start. That word, slow, that slow to speak is an expression. It's actually one word. And and it's a word that's, again, it's a Greek word, brados. And it literally means to take a long time. Before you speak, do not speak hastily. Consider all things before you say something. Consider the other person. Consider their perspective. Consider where they're at, their weaknesses, their strengths. Consider what is really true. You know, are you the one that gets the the fish story that keeps getting bigger every time you tell the story? Re-examine and remind yourself, no, it was actually this big, the one that I caught, right? (laughs) Check. Examine those things before you... The word also means being deliberate. In my mind, when I hear deliberate, I think of being careful. Carefully choosing your words. If you're not sure exactly what words to use, how is it going to hurt to not speak at all and talk a little bit later? Amen? Be careful what words to use. Be careful. Proverbs tells us over and over and over how dangerous our hasty speech can be. Right? The tongue. Talks about the tongue. It's this little tiny thing, and it can cause gigantic fires. One little spark. Your tongue is like one little spark, and it can burn down miles and miles and miles. Right? You know, again, I like that whole two ears and one mouth thing. Thinking about, you, you hear it, and before you respond... Play it through again. Listen to it again. Before you respond, pray about it. Listen to it through the ears of God. Think about what you have heard before you just respond. That's really hard for some of us. It's hard for me. And I think it's hard for a lot of us. I think that sometimes our our strengths go with our weaknesses. And so this is one of those that I have a strength, but I think my weakness is that, you know, I I want to keep moving. I want to get going. I don't want to wait. I don't want to stop. I want to keep moving forward. I want to get things done. I want to keep going, pressing ahead. And so that means, okay, but I got to say something. It doesn't matter if I say it wrong. Let's just keep moving. I I laugh every time I see uh, Toy Story. I don't know how many of you have seen Toy Story. Uh, but, you know, some great lessons in there. And, and there's the pig. I don't know if you remember. Do you remember the pig in Toy Story? And he's, and he's changing the channels. <laughs> Do you remember this? I, I, I see myself in the pig, okay, in a lot of ways. But, but for, for this way right now. And he's, and they, 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 he's looking for the toy, the, the guy that sells the toy. Remember, you remember in the story? And, and they're like, hey, that was him. That was him. And he's like, not, not too far. I'm, I'm, I can't, too fast. I'm going back around. I got to keep going. I'll go all the way back around. I'm not going to stop and go backwards because it'd be easier just to keep going and keep going back. <sighs> That's me, right? And so I think sometimes, you know, good work ethic kind of goes with being impetuous or, you know, you have, you, you have good and you have bad that comes along and you need to think about what you heard first. Now, what's funny, what's sad, I guess, is a lot of us right now are saying, yeah, that is, I hope so-and-so's hearing this, I hope so-and-so's hearing this. Every one of us needs to get better at being, at thinking about what we say before we say it. Are those really the words that God wants us to say? Remember when Peter said, I will never leave you, God. I will never let you down. Well, I mean, those words sound great on the surface, don't they? They sound like great Christian words. I will never let God down. Within a couple hours, he let him down. Desperately. Badly. If he just thought for a second, Peter would have realized, yeah, but I I also make mistakes sometimes. I better be careful. Think about what you say. Slow to speak. Any of you do this where you you think of the words you're going to say and you play the scenario in your head, and then you kind of predict how people are going to respond to that? 
And then I do this whole thing in my head. I, have pl I played out this whole like theater production in my head before I say something sometimes, because I'm afraid of what I'm going to do when I say, or how it's going to affect, or what they're going to think. Pray about it. Think about what God wants you to say. And then the last one is slow to anger. He says, be slow to anger. I found a couple great quotes. I love these. I just found these yesterday. I love this. Number one, temper is such a valuable thing, it's a shame to lose it. You catch that? Temper versus anger. There's righteous anger. There's righteous anger. Wearsby said this. It is temper that helps give steel its strength. The person who cannot get angry at sin does not have much strength to fight it. When Jesus saw sin, it would make him angry. There's righteous anger. When someone was hurt or taken advantage of, Jesus would step in. Remember? Flipping the tables over. People lying and taking advantage and mis-selling, misleading people that were coming in that were poor, that could not help. If sin doesn't bother you, you need to check yourself at the door. Sin should bother you. It should bother you to see sin and not just say things like, oh, well, that's, you know, that's the way life is. That's kind of how it is, you know, how things go. No, sin should anger you. Sin, anger, anger is there for a reason to drive us to do great things, to, to step up and, to, and, to, and protect those that cannot protect themselves or help those that cannot help themselves. It, it's there for a good purpose, but it can easily be let out of control. And you've got to keep that harnessed by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit needs to be in charge of that, not us. When we're in charge of it, oh boy, we get angry about a lot of things, right? And some of us right now, I really don't have a temper problem. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. I'm going to tell you this. There are some Christians who don't ever get angry enough at what they see in this world. And that's still, a, that's still an anger problem. Now, there's some of us, of which I am the club president, who get <laughs> angry too much or get there too easy. But I'm going to tell you something. It's just as much of a problem to sit back and say, oh, well, you know, we got to love and we got to be caring and we got to be compassionate. If it's sin, it's a sin. Say something about it. Don't sit there with no backbone. Step up against what is wrong. Step up, stand up for those that cannot stand up for themselves. Now, you can see where my challenge lies is on the other side of that. Some of us, you know, we all have a challenge somewhere. Every Christian does. I, I just, I, I can't help but say it, and I don't like to get political, but I'm just going to say it. If killing unborn babies does not bother you, you have a problem. And I'm not saying that I have all the answers. I don't. But I'm telling you this. I know that's a sin. We should be angry about that stuff. Now, remember, this is not just talking about just being angry at people in general. I think we take this, and, and it's okay to take it and apply it to other ways because God's word is still true. But remember, this verse is pointing back to talking about God's word. Your outline there? It's talking about God's word. So it's saying to us, hey, guys, in terms of God's word, don't get angry. Don't get angry at God's word. If you're sinning, don't be mad at God because you're sinning. Don't be mad at God because he said this is a sin. You hear what I'm saying? I think sometimes we don't put these verses together and we think, well, this is just talking about people that have a bad temper. Well, you can apply it to that, but it's bigger than that. It's bigger than that, okay? Don't get angry at God's word because it reveals the sins in our lives. But when you read God's word, understand you're going into it 
Um, and you're going to be humbled. Anytime you read God's word, it's going to humble you because we're sinners and this is correct. Okay? If you're going to get angry at God's word, that's like looking in the mirror and seeing, ooh, I do not like what I see. And so how do you respond? I'll just throw the mirror down and break it. <laughs> there, problem gone. <laughs> if you don't like the way your hair looks, getting rid of the mirror is not going to help fix it. Amen? You're going to have to fix your hair. You're going to have to do something. I, I, I don't know. I, again, I'm not an expert on that one either. Okay? My, my answer to that is half a can of hairspray. That's what I do. Okay? <laughs> but I don't know what you guys do. Okay? Listen, don't look in the mirror and get mad at the mirror for what it tells you. Don't look at God's word and get angry because he says that certain things you want to do um, are sins. See, see, here's the problem. Christians, we have... We, myself included, we have these things that we want to do. Now, deep down inside, we know they're wrong. But we want to do them anyway. And so we will look at the Bible, and we take, this is why I always tell you don't take stuff out of context. We'll look in there, and we'll try to find a verse here or there that we can take and misapply it so that we can justify what it is we want to do. I don't know, and there's some things that God, he says, and I don't know why he said it. All I know is he's God and he said it, so I better do it. Amen? I don't know why he said certain things. I don't know why he made certain things the way he did. I know some of these topics are tearing churches apart, tearing Christians apart, and taking people away from churches because they want to do what is popular in society and not do what God's word says. I'm amazed when I see a church who is flat out saying, let me tell you something, sin is sin and calls those sins sins and they still grow because the world just doesn't like to hear what it's doing is sinful. Oh, I'm stepping on all of our toes here, mine, yours, everybody's. There's things out there that if we would just change if God just changed, tweaked a few things in the Bible, man, we could be so much more popular. But God's not going to change because truth's not going to change. And so I got news for you. You got to decide who is it you want to be popular with, the world or God? Who is it you want to be right with? You know, um, I like thinking of, I like the example of God being the, the plumb line. Do you, do you know what a plumb line is? If you've ever put up a fence, pick it like fence, uh, you've done something with it. Now, you may have used a, a level with a little bubble, maybe, uh, or you've used a little plumb line. Plumb line is just a string with the heavy thing in the bottom. It goes directly down toward the gravity, and it tells you what's straight, right? Now, if you've ever put up a fence without a plumb line or without a level, <laughs> the neighborhood knows you made that fence, Right? Because it started out like this, and it ended up something like this. There might be some other board. Then all of a sudden, you had to cut a board in a triangle to get back into the, you know, and you're like, you know. But that's the way the world is. The world would rather, rather than change themselves to match the plumb line, they would rather take verses out of the Bible and, move, and grab the string of the plumb line to make it even with them so that the world, so that they think they're right, or the rest of the world thinks they're right. I got news for you. You can hold the plumb line like this all day long. It's, it's not going to change the fact that that board is crooked. Amen? God's word is straight. It is true. And we have to make our size, our lives kind of like line up with God's word. Not take God's word and try to make it line up with ours, which ours is not straight. So it would be like saying, we got to make our lives line up with God's word not try to take God's word and make it crooked up along with our lives. I don't know what that word is, but, okay? Think about it. This entire verse that we've been reading here, in verse 19, is talking about anger comes in, listening, the anger happens, okay, what's going to go out? What, what's going to happen? How am I going to respond? Who am I, what am I listening to? Then it goes to verse 20. And he talks about this anger again. In verse 20, he says, Human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. 
Human anger. See, there's nothing wrong with godly anger. The problem is human anger. Amen? See, something happens. We get mad. When, when we get mad, think about why am I mad? Am I mad because it breaks God's laws? Or am I mad because it wounded my pride? Am I mad because it goes against what God's word said? Or am I mad because somebody disrespected me? Am I mad because he went against what, you know, I learned in God's word? Or am I mad because somebody laughed at me? Is it my pride or is it God? I mean, why am I angry? Human anger does not produce the righteousness, the right behavior that God wants us to have. One person said, people who fly into a rage always make a bad landing. I like that. You're going to fly into a rage, it's not going to go well. God, if you're going to get into a rage, you better know God's in charge of that rage. That better be godly rage. You better be in charge of that all the way because, boy, when we get into human rage, uh, thinking, logic, all this stuff just leaves. Yeah. Phillips, one of my favorite translators, one of my favorite commentators that I like to read, he put this verse, this is the way he translated this verse. He said, man's temper is never the means of achieving God's true goodness. Your temper is not going to help you be good in God's eyes. God's temper, God's anger might be good for you at that moment, if that's what God chooses for you at that moment, if it's a sin and he wants you to move on it, etc. But your temper is not going to bring that. And think about it. What does our temper do? Our temper brings us to uh, getting mad at people, telling people off, giving them the silent treatment. I mean, all these different things that we do, this is what our, this is what our temper brings. None of them are godly responses. None of them. None of them bring us any good. All they do is make things worse. When it's our temper, our temper makes things worse. God's anger makes things right because it brings things back in line with that plumb line. Yeah. Mm. Mm. That word for. Now, now, I want you to remember this. Anytime you're studying God's word and it says for, think about it. it one of the commentators I like to read always says, what's the for for? Like, think about it. What's the for for? Whatever he just said connects to what you're about to read. What's the, there, what's the for there for? Okay? He's saying for. The reason is, the reason verse 19 was so important. This, the, this verse is the reason why verse 19 is so important. When, when you're thinking about 19, you've got to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and, and slow to anger. Why? Because if you don't, then verse 20 you can't achieve God's goodness. You can't do what God wants you to do because you're in your own anger. That's why you got to do those things in 19 so that you can do verse 20. That's why it's there. Now, that word anger, again, I want to make sure I define that. That word anger, it's important to di differentiate that between um, anger and then, and then godly anger. Regular person anger and godly anger. This is a different word. This is the word that is orgeo in, in the Greek. Again, I'm sure I'm butchering that word, but... None of you speak Greek, so it's okay. I can say whatever I want. I can make up any noise, sound. You wouldn't even know, would you? Okay. Uh, and that means, it means the word there, when it says, you know, you don't want God, um, human anger, that word, when it said human anger, it's the word in the Greek for swelling up until it bursts. Swelling up until something bursts. You ever, you ever seen someone turn their ankle so bad that it looks like their leg is just going to explode? You ever seen that? I've done it to myself a couple times. And it got so big, the skin was stretched so thin, you could like see all the tiny little veins and stuff underneath. The skin was getting that swollen. It was swollen. This is how our anger gets. This is human anger, where it just comes in and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And at some point, what's going to happen? It's going to explode. And some poor unlucky sap is going to be the one to get your anger. And it may be someone who had nothing to do with why you got angry. And the poor lady at the restaurant gets you chewing her out because your kids won't do their homework. Or whatever. 
Amen? You ever had somebody get angry at you and you're like, where in the world did that come from? Because orgeo, they got so angry, they kept getting, that's just human anger. Human anger. Hold it in, hold it in. Get more mad, get more angry. Think about it. Stew over it. Seethe over it. Until it explodes on someone who is, has nothing to do with what's happening. And what's happened is you just lost your witness to that person and whoever else can hear you yelling. Yeah. Hmm. Can't do it. Okay? It's going to burst. That's why the Bible takes so much time to talk about how you're supposed to hanger, ha, ha, hanger? handle anger. It's not hanger. Handle anger. You're supposed to handle anger correctly. And how you're supposed to handle anger correctly, one-on-one, -on -one, two and three, that kind of thing. Some things you let go. You let go. Let God have them. That, 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 that's my favorite one. I, whenever I say that, people look at me like, yeah, yeah okay, go, go to the next option because that one's not possible. You, you know you could just let something go. I got about three shaking heads. The rest of us are looking at me like, yeah, right. <laughs> you could just let things go. You realize there needs to be times where you look at something and say, look, I could make this into an argument, but why? Why am I going to sit here and, and, get, and get into an argument over something dumb? Let it go. This also means that we need to, when we hear something and we sit and we smolder on it, it's not healthy at all. And, and people that have no belief in God whatsoever will tell you that there are dangerous effects on your physical health if you don't spiritually, and I'll say my part, spiritually learn how to take care of anger, hurt. Okay, not just, you know, heartburn and ulcers and these kind of things, even worse than that. And if you have heartburn and ulcer, you know that's terrible, but I'm talking about even worse than that. That's where this stuff can, you know, manifest itself if you don't handle this stuff correctly. It is not healthy and it's not godly to let it just sit and, and simmer. If you're not going to go directly and talk to someone about the problem, then let it go and move on. If you say, I just can't do it, okay, then pray about it and go speak to them. You know what I've learned? Nine times out of ten, I think that's a good number. Four out of five, maybe that's better. But nine times out of ten, I think, let's go, eight and a half out of ten. How about that? Right in the middle, okay? Eight and a half times out of ten, when I go and I talk to that person and I was, oh, this about that, and I talk about it, it's like, oh, five seconds later, I'm like, oh, that's really no big deal. Why did I stew over this for the last two weeks? Why did I lose sleep over this when it took three seconds to fix it? Mm. Humble pie. Mm. Humbling, right? He says, achieve or produce in that verse. It says that you want to produce. It does not produce the godliness that we want. Human anger does not produce the godliness that he calls us to have. That word means work. It does not work out. Human anger is not a good it's not a viable way of working out godliness in your life. It doesn't work. The two don't go together. You're not going to accidentally get at godliness. And the way to do that is not to use human anger. It's not going to work. It does not give you what it's... It's, it's like, you know, doing something totally different and saying you're going to learn how to do a different skill. This is not going to teach you how to do that. This human anger is not going to teach you how to have godliness. The two do not have anything to do with each other, and it's not going to work out godliness in our lives. It's our goal every day to work out godliness in our lives. We have challenges every day, yes? Small, big, medium, big, bigger, real big. We have all these challenges in our lives, and the goal is to, to meet those, to face those, and work out godliness in the face of those challenges. 
handle them in a godly way. And if you're a Christian, you would say, work is a good word because it is work. The Christian life is not easy. It's work. Amen? Remember that gymnast I was telling you about? She doesn't become one of the best gymnasts in the world by doing no work. It takes hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of work. And as a Christian, you got to put those hours in and you got to work at being godly. And human anger does not go with that. It can't happen. Okay, the two cannot meet. Working out righteousness, it says. That word is diakonis. And it's being proper, being right, being in accordance to what God requires. The word righteousness comes from the same word that we get the word straightness. And it takes us right back to that plumb. If you're trying to work out straightness, and we are all crooked. I hate to tell you, but you are crooked. I am crooked. We're all a bunch of S's and C's and I don't know, whatever else these things, dollar signs. We got all kinds of crookedness in our lives. And working out straightness to God is work. And it takes work and it takes time and it takes that effort. God sets the standard and we follow that. And the only way to get an accordance to to straightness of God is to follow his word. That's how you do it. You don't find it anywhere else. You are not going to listen to the world and find godliness. You're going to find it right here. I tell you, I even tell you when I'm up here, I say, hey, listen, you take what I say and you compare it to God's word because I'm a person, I can make mistakes. People make mistakes all the time. You compare it to God's word. His word never makes mistakes. That's the straight one. I have straight days and I have some Real crooked days. God's word is always straight. Okay? That's God's word. Now, I'm going to say it again. So many Christians, and I have it in your note there in your, in your notes. So many Christians today approach the Bible by knowing what they want to find and then looking for verses that they can take out of context to apply it to their lives. And take God's word and change it around to match where they're at. And we can't take your, you, got, you can't take God's word and change it to match your life. You've got to take your life and change it to match God's word. And I'm going to tell you, there are things when you read it, you may not like. I'm, I'm just going to tell you that straight up. There's some things you're going to read in God's word, you're going to be like, oh, I don't like that. You know why you don't like that? Because you are crooked. Because you and I are jacked up. And so when we read it, we think to ourselves, holy cow, that doesn't sound right. Of course it doesn't sound right because your ear is messed up. Your brain is crooked. The way you hear things is wrong. You, have, you are a sinner. So when things come in, you don't like the way they sound. All I can tell you is tough cookies. It doesn't matter what you like. What matters is what God's word says. There's some things, if Lincoln got his way, there's some things he would change about the Bible. That's, the, that's the, the, the sinful part of Lincoln. I would change some things. Now, I would be wrong. But th- those, are, those are some things that Lincoln would change, the, 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 the flesh side of me. And I'm sure when you read some things, there's probably some things you don't like. And maybe you're a good enough Christian to where you catch that and you don't let anybody know. But let's be honest, you didn't like hearing it. And that's Okay. You know what that is? That's a sign to you that you are a sinner and what you're right there, that part of your heart is wrong and you need to attack it. And you need to attack that with submission. You need to attack that with obedience. You need to attack that with just being open and honest and telling, giving it to God and saying, Lord, this part of following you bothers me and I want to follow you, so please make this right. Our pride doesn't like to hear some of the things that God says. But that's sinful human pride, right? Verse 21, then the last verse says, putting away, he says, then therefore, putting aside, therefore, connecting to the other verses, right? Because of these things, therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness. Listen, listen, that's our job. We're supposed to be putting away that junk every day. We got plenty of that junk to put away, amen? Putting away that junk. 
I, I believe the reason more Christians do not love the word of God is because their minds are so full of so much filth out there that, that you know, they, there's so much junk out there. You've been taught stuff, you've heard stuff, you've seen stuff, you've, you've been told stuff, you've got all this other junk in here, you're compromised, you've got all this other information, and when you hear God's word, sometimes you think, well, wait a minute, that doesn't sound right. It doesn't sound like, it doesn't match what I've been taught. It doesn't match what I learned in school. It doesn't match what I, what I was told by mom. It doesn't match what I, was, what I learned from that friend. It doesn't match what I saw on that TV show. It doesn't match what I read on that bumper sticker or that movie or that whatever. All, you got all these things. It doesn't match what I heard on that blog. It doesn't match what Oprah told me. How can that be right? How can God's word be right? That's not what Oprah said. <laughs> we got all these other things coming in. Amen. And then sometimes we read God's word and we think, man, that doesn't sound right. Well, maybe we're doing too much listening to all the rest of it and not enough listening to God's word. Now, I'm not going to sit here and tell you to stop watching TV or stop going to the movies and any of that stuff. Your decision, what you should do and watch and where you should go, et cetera, what movies to see and TV shows, that's between you and the Holy Spirit. And if you're going to lean on me to figure that answer out, you're in big trouble. You better lean on the Holy Spirit for that. I'm going to tell some of you right now. Some of you, some of us, have problems to where we shouldn't go to any movies because we have those kind of problems. Some of us don't have those problems. We don't have those challenges. A lot of people like to go to the movies, apparently, because it got really quiet. Okay, it's all right. It's all right. I mean, it's between you and the Holy Spirit, what you can do, what you can't do. What's appropriate, what's not appropriate. We do that with our kids, right? We tell our kids, hey, you're not ready for that. Right? I think there's a lot of adults that are not ready for certain things. Spiritually, they're not ready. You shouldn't be seeing that because when you see that, you're not going to be able to handle it and process it the correct way. So you shouldn't be there. And whatever it is, not just movies, not, not, everything, okay? Everything, talk shows, whatever, all this stuff. All this stuff that comes in our heads. Need to be ready. It said putting aside. That's the Greek word uh, apothemai, and it means to take off. So that word right there, putting aside the wickedness. Our goal is to put aside the wickedness of the world, right? That word is the same that they used for taking their clothes off. So I want you to think about this example. You've been outside working in the yard. It's 105 degrees in the middle of the summer. By the way, why were you working outside in 105? But anyways, you're outside, and it's 105 and you are as sweaty and smelly. And by the way, you were mowing, and part of the grass is dusty. So now you've got dust on top of mud, on top of dirt, on top of sweat. It's just a real nasty witch's brew of nastiness on you. Okay? You are just nasty. Okay? And so you go into the house, if your spouse lets you in the house that way. And you go into the house, and you say, man, I am gross. i got two things I could do. I could take these clothes off and wash and put on clean clothes. Or I could just, the easier way would be to take those clean clothes from the closet and just put them on top of these clothes because no one will know. Okay, in about two minutes when your odor permeates the outside clothes, people will know that you didn't wash. Amen? This apothemi, this word, is saying you got to take it off. Don't come to church and say amen and put your hand up and raise and do whatever you got to do and be holy and I don't, you know, carry two Bibles to church because you're really super holy. Whatever, whoever you are, don't come to church and act like that and just put that church junk on top of your nastiness because people will see through that quickly. That's what this is talking about. This is saying, hey, take off the gross stuff first. Clean yourself. Clean your nasty self. And then put on some of this godliness. Don't tell me you're going to put on the godliness by not getting rid of the ugliness first. You like the gossip. Don't just say, you know, put on some godliness on top of that. Get rid of the gossiping and then put the godliness on top of it. Get rid of the junk, whatever. I just pulled that one out of the hat. Whatever sin you have trouble with. Don't put something on top of it and hope nobody notices. 
if you've ever gone into a junior high locker room, <laughs> it, it, it smells, I'm sorry if there's junior highers here, I love you, but it smells, boys, I've only been in junior high boys locker rooms, I will tell you this, girls, you'll have to talk about yours, I don't know what's happening in yours, it's a wonderland, I choose not to check, okay, <laughs> but the boys junior high locker room, it smells like an axe factory just exploded, <laughs> right? So they get done with practice, they smell horrible. Tyler, you know exactly what I'm talking about here. You, they, it, they smell horrible. Okay, and we've all been there. Every one of us. Okay? And so their option, their decision, is to put on half a bottle of Axe on top of that. Okay? That's not going to work, Christians. I don't know how to explain it to you. Too much ax just hurts, makes your eyes burn, okay? But when you put that in with the funk, that other smell, you know what I'm talking about? When you put those two together, it is a horrible, horrible mixture. Christians, this is what we're doing all the time. We're coming to church, and we're not getting rid of the bad actions we're doing. We're hearing what the pastor says or the Bible says or whatever, wherever you're seeing, and you're saying, I'm going to add that stuff to my life. you got to get rid of the filthiness. And what it does is it quickly, you can quickly see through that. It's a scam, and you don't have to be a Christian to see through it. Non-Christians see right through that. They know it is fake. They know it is false really quick. Ask any teacher if they've gone up and tried to fake it in front of a classroom. Uh, those kids know within three seconds. Man, you don't even know what you're talking about. They know exactly. You, you don't know the answer to this question. Don't even pretend. They know. Non-Christians see right through our junk. We got to be real. We got to be authentic. How many non-Christians don't come to church because some Christian who is being ugly here has gone over here and then said, oh, but and you need to go to church with me. I mean, and we're all guilty of it. We're all guilty of it. We've all done it. And it ends right there on 21b, the second part. Then it says, then in humility receive the word of God, which is able to save your souls. In humility. See, a humble spirit. I couldn't think of any other word, so I came up with this word. I hope it makes sense to you. The impeded, the a humble spirit welcomes God's unimpeded message. A humble spirit says, okay, I'm just going to get rid of all the other barriers that get in front of me hearing God's word. It could be my culture. It could be how I was raised. It could be my weaknesses. It could be my opinions. It could be my pride. It could be my I don't understand, my lack of understanding, whatever it is. Whatever barriers are there, a humble spirit says, I'm just going to get rid of all of this stuff. I'm going to get it out of the way, and I'm just going to hear what God says, and I'm going to take that as truth, even if I don't like it. If, if the world doesn't like it, it doesn't matter. The world doesn't like a lot of what God says, and that's okay. That's okay. I mean, it's truth. It shows you the world is wrong. It shows you the world is wrong. Humility is a quality of being uh, uh, over, but not being overly impressed by one's self-importance found that in one of my, my uh, books that I was studying from, and I really liked the way that the author said that. Humility is a quality of not being overly impressed by one's self-importance. Oh, yeah, some of us are a legend in our own minds, aren't we? Yeah. Gentle friendliness was one of the definitions I found when I was looking up godly humility. Isn't that interesting? Gentle friendliness, hmm. accommodating other people's weaknesses, and being patient in the midst of difficult circumstances. That sounds like a great person to be, amen? To do that, you got to do 19, 20, and 21. You got to listen to God's word, you got to apply his word. You got to decide whatever I have in my life that is bad that I need to take off, I'm going to take it off. Whatever pride I have, whatever issues I have, whatever reasons that I have that are keeping me from listening to God's word, I need to get rid of it so that I can hear God speak directly to me. 
as the musicians come forward, I just wonder, what is keeping you from hearing God speak to you? Listen, if you have God in your heart, that's where it starts. If you've never asked Jesus to come in, that's why you don't hear him speaking to you. you got to have Jesus in your heart. Okay? All Christians, be ready to say amen. You, there's no other way to go to heaven. You have to have Jesus in your heart. Okay? So now, if that's the truth and you have Jesus in your heart, then he is speaking to you. He doesn't take vacations. He doesn't take holidays. And he doesn't like to, like, trick you or hide things. He's not like the Easter bunny, and he thinks it's fun for you to go searching. That's not Jesus. He wants to speak to you. The problem is we're not listening. And we got too many other things out there keeping us from hearing God speak to us. What is it? Those things may not be bad in and of themselves. See, the thing that could be keeping you from hearing God is your kids. Now, our kids are not bad in and of themselves. Don't, parents, don't, don't say it. I know what you're going to say. Oh, they're pretty bad. Nah, don't say that. They're a blessing from God. Okay? But those kids could be the thing keeping us from hearing what God really says. Yeah. Our talents, God giving you talents. He gives those to you so that you can use them in serving him, right? Those talents could be the reason why you're not listening to God because you're so proud of how awesome you are. I hear Pastor Frank say it all the time, okay? They are here worship. They're not performing. They're not putting on a show for you. You're not coming to a concert, okay? You're not coming to see Frank and the Rockettes or whatever, okay? <laughs> all right? I'm sorry, David's back there. The, ro the rocks and the rockets, sorry. Okay, uh, that, you know, I was going to say prank in the pussycats, but I didn't. <laughs> Again, David wouldn't like that one either. So, Listen, that's not why they're here. They're not here to put on a show. The same time where you're worshiping, they're worshiping. They're just leading you in worship, but that, that's it. Right? I mean, our God's an orderly God, so when we come to worship, we ought to be, all be singing the same song. If we didn't, we'd all come here and we'd all be singing 75 different songs at the same time. So they lead the worship, but they worship too. They're not putting on a show. And if that's what's happening, if they're putting on a show, then that person needs to stop singing, needs to stop playing, and they need to sit down and just worship. If, if what I do ever becomes something about my pride, I need to stop, I need to sit down. Okay, it has nothing to do with me. If anything good comes out of my mouth, and I know that's a question sometimes, but if anything good comes out of my mouth, it's because God said it through me. Okay, don't, don't get, I know you're being nice. Oh, that was great. You did a good job, whatever. If it's anything good, it's because it came from God. Okay, period. All right, you hear that? If I'm doing anything good, it's because God did it. What is it that's keeping you from hearing what God really wants you to do? Who are you listening to instead of God? What are you listening to instead of listening to God? You think about that as you stand and as you sing.